שלום, בוקר טוב, בוקר טוב. Yes, you How guys sound awake. Feeling? I love it. Huh? Yeah, you guys are awake this morning. You guys have energy. Third day, final day. You guys excited? It's a little bittersweet, because we have to say bye at the end of the day, but let's enjoy every moment leading up until then. Whoever wasn't here early this morning, there was an amazing time of soaking in the presence of the Lord and worshiping with Kess Evans. And um, she came up with her first title disc, Savior Redeemer. It's amazing. We've been listening to it all of time. You guys have also been hearing it in the background when you come and go, if you haven't noticed. So you can go up. We have the whole table up there with resources of worship that's going on in the land. So you have Kess Evans as well as Jamie Hilson and Mikedem and a lot of others. So check up there when you guys have a chance and get some of the music to take back home with you. And speaking of music... Well, Let's wait a second. We have oh. also the Connect Center right oh. outside. So just to make sure that you'll go there when you have the breaks and make sure to meet some people, meet some ministries from yes. the land, mm -hmm. and connect with other ministries. And if we speak about music... Well, actually, start. there's one third thing now. Oh. I get to cut you off. <laughs> um, we just had a request if people can move to the center. I know I sound like a broken record with this one. But be cozy. It's okay to sit next to a person you don't know. Let's move to the center. Let's be a nice, cozy family. Awesome. Awesome. Now you can really worship together, yeah? All right, let's go. Let's start with some worship. Well, good morning again, everybody. Who was here for the, for the Chazakim concert last night? That was amazing. I think there was m almost as much Bible in their lyrics as there in the Bible. <laughs> almost, about that. <laughs> Probably why it was amazing. They had an amazing ministry last night. It was really a blessing. Well, it is the last day. But that doesn't mean, see you later, not goodbye, right? Next year in Jerusalem, this year in Jerusalem. So like I told you, we're going to be joined every set by somebody new. And today we have a really special guest for us. This is Iriti Fert. Literally, I, I wouldn't have time to tell you everything that she does. And she is for the community here in Jerusalem. Really, it's an endless list. But she's a phenomenal worship leader and a phenomenal songwriter. And she, uh, do you run it or of, of Yuval? What is the official title? Yeah. yeah, okay, so there's a ministry, like a school of music and arts right outside here uh, called Yuval. And they teach kids music and dance and drama. Everything. Rap. It's amazing. It's an amazing program that they kind of spearheaded. So she has a real heart for kids and she's very. Just a wonderful person. So we're very grateful that you're here with us. They should be here in the afternoon as well. So well, with that, Lord, we just commit this morning to you. We commit this worship to you. We thank you for waking us up, that we are in our right minds, and that with that mind we can worship you in spirit and in truth. In Yeshua's name, amen.
it says that his banner over us is love. And there's so many great things that is our God. And we want to worship him this morning because he's worthy. for your everlasting arms holding us in every situation of our life, every storm that we're going through, every hardship. God, you love us and your love is an everlasting. Your love is eternal. We worship you tonight, Yeshua. We thank you for your love that is so high, so long, so wide, so deep.
Good Father, and you love us, and that love is forever. We're so grateful, Lord, that we can rely on one thing that will last forever.
presence is with us, Lord. Even when we're not here in this room, Lord, when we leave this room, your presence goes with us because it dwells inside of us, Lord. I pray that it would take over everything that we do and it would dictate everything that we do and we would show the love of the Father to all who need it. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thanks to the worship team. Isn't that amazing? We can worship God in different languages in different tongues, in different areas, in different areas from the world, in Jerusalem, right? That's amazing. So now we have some ministry time. I want to introduce to you a, a Messianic congregation. It's called Hamayan. Um, it's been founded, it was founded in 1989, and it's in the proverbs of Tel Aviv in a small town called Kfar Saba. So with not speaking too much, I want to please welcome uh, Pastor Tony Sperandeo. Shalom. I came to Israel, I was 25 years old. Who is 25 years old here? Just raise your hands. Good, very good. I came, I, I, I was just newly wed, and I came to Israel to bring the good news to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I was a pagan, I got saved in Amsterdam, Holland, and the Lord brought me together with my Israeli wife to Israel. And the first thing I, I said, Lord, I want to be the most effective young person for your kingdom. What is your greatest need in Israel? And I just felt the Lord speaking to me with sadness in his heart, telling me, I have no shepherds in Israel. Feed my flock. And he showed me the woundedness of the people of Israel. The rejection for 2,000 years. And I said to the Lord, Hineni Adonai, here I am, Lord, send me. And the Lord spoke to us to open our home um, in the city of Kfar Saba. And we started with three other families to gather together and to pray and to share scriptures together. From the verse of Isaiah chapter 61, for the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach Good news to the poor, to bind the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Um, there is no greater ministry than the ministry of Yeshua. The ministry of Yeshua is to bring restoration to the person, to bring salvation, to bring healing, to bring deliverance, to bring revelation. And our congregation, Kilata Mayan, was started 27 years ago. I was a young man, but now I'm a grandfather. So as a grandfather, I just want to look back to all the faithfulness of God. You know, when, when, when we started our congregation, there was maybe 200, 300 Messianic Jewish believers in Israel. Wayne knows about it because he was there at the same time. You know, we were just a small group. We had only one conferences for young people. We had, um, you know, uh, everybody knew one another. Now I'm glad to tell you I don't know all my brothers and sisters here in Israel. In fact, uh, there are so many. Uh, so many that are attended congregation, but also so many that are not attending congregation. And I think the greatest challenge for us now in Israel is to establish framework for people to join and be part of congregation. Um, our ministry is for the Jewish people, but by the grace of God, about three years ago, we were able just to minister to some Indian people, their caregivers, working here in Israel with the Holocaust survivors, and it just snowballed. They're so open to the Lord, Indians, Sri Lankans, Nepalese, and uh, now in Tel Aviv, by the grace of God, we have also an English-speaking congregation. Now, this is the work of the Lord. This is what God has done in Israel in all those years. I'm looking back and I'm just amazed to see because the scripture is being fulfilled now as the Lord is speaking to us in the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 25. I don't want you to be ignorant, my brothers, that there's a veil that is being put 
upon the Jewish people. But that veil is going to be removed when the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And when you hear about uh, 30 years ago, about 200, 300 Jewish believers, and now thousands of Jewish believers, young and old, you know that the Lord is starting to remove the veil. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, there, are, there are many more congregations, many more believers, and we know that the Holy Spirit is working. You know, the first one will be the last. The first one to be saved were the Jewish people, and they are going to be the last one to be saved. And this is a sign for all the nations. When you see, when you see Jewish people coming to faith, you know that Yeshua is coming back. And uh, he's coming back in Jerusalem in the city of the great king, here where you are sitting. You know, it all started here. It will all end here, you know. And Jerusalem uh, is mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter 14. Israel is mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter 32, first time. And the last time in chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. So if you put your finger between Revelation and Genesis, this is all about Israel, Israel, Israel. And it's amazing how the world is that does not want to deal with Israel. And even the Christians, so many Christians are so ignorant about Israel. And this is why the Lord led me uh, this year just to write a book. I call it Israel for Dummies. It's called The Mystery of Israel and the Church. It's just Israel 101, for those who don't know anything about Israel, you're welcome just to uh, go and take this book and learn and be educated because a Israel will be the sign, will be the sign whether a stumbling block for some of the Christians, but also maybe a stepping stone to be understanding the purposes of God for the nations and for Israel. God bless you. Thank you for praying for us. We need your prayers. My greatest need right now, you know, I have white hair. I just need young people to come along and to, uh, you know, we have to pass on the baton to the next generation. Uh, I'm married with one wife. I have four children. And uh, I want to thank you for listening to me. And that's it. Bye. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. So, um, he was born in Israel into a traditional Jewish family. Um, he came to faith in Europe many years ago. <laughs> uh, he holds a, deg a degree, a doctoral degree in psychology and theology studies. In 2006, he nominated to be the uh, president of Israel College of the Bible. Besides the fact that he's my pastor, my boss, and also a good friend, he's going to be our main speaker for today. Please welcome Dr. Erez Tsoref. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Shalom to you. Shalom. What a privilege to be here together. Thank you, Moti, for this great introduction. I'll uh, just give you the one-minute version of my spiritual journey, kind of in between what Moti had said. Um, I was born and raised in Israel. And uh, in my generation, I'm not that old, I hope, my kids say otherwise, but in my generation, you know, we have never heard anything about Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. I never met a Christian person, I never seen the uh, New Testament, and had no idea who this Yeshua, Jesus, is. And that's pretty much, you know, a phenomenon we refer to as Jesus being the best kept secret in Israel. And after, um, after my military service, after high school and military service, I, like a lot of Israelis, I decided to backpack and travel around the world. And as I did for the first time in my life, in the age of 22, I've met a group of young Christians. Uh, I was in the city of Amsterdam, and I was not there for any godly purpose, but God, God in his sense of humor, reached out to touch me there. And through this testimony of Young Christians, young Gentile Christians, God has used them to cause me, as a Jewish person, to jealousy. And there are two things that attract my attention in those Gentile Christians. One, they had a relationship with God. A very foreign concept to a lot of Jewish people today. And I couldn't understand it, but I could see it. I couldn't ignore it either. And the second thing is that although many of them were very young, 
believers not very mature in their faith, they, have, um, they had some knowledge of the Hebrew Scripture, the Old Testament, in passages that although I studied in school for 12 years, we've never looked at. And so God has used that to, and as the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sinful nature and I've become a disciple of Yeshua, I was convinced that I'm the first and only Jewish-Israeli person, you know, in 2,000 years since the time of Paul, <laughs> to have made this great discovery that He is our Messiah, not just everybody else's, primarily our Messiah. And so with that deep conviction and great joy, uh, I felt God's calling me to go back to Israel, tell my family, my friends, my people, and everybody else that I meet about Him. And in a lot of ways, this is still what I do. And at the end, I'll tell you a little more of what we do at One for Israel. Well, this morning, I want to talk about some passages from the book of Zechariah, actually a passage from chapter 1. But before I go there, I just want to highlight the fact that all of you are aware of that we are living in a world that is changing very, very rapidly right in front of our eyes. It's true technologically, with the amount of information we need to deal with every day. It's true socially. I mean, look at the structure of the family and the, st the structure of gender in the society around us, and it's true politically. Look at the Middle East, and I'm not even going to go to look at the upcoming election in the United States. But all those things cause many, many, many people a lot of instability, and it causes them to question also what is truth. And that shakes a lot of people's faith in whatever they may believe, but here's some good news. We are privileged to serve the God that is internal and does not change. And His Word, His self-revelation to us, remains forever stable. And in His Word, God is calling us, both in the Hebrew Scripture and in the New Testament, God is calling us again and again to be understanding the times. Understanding the times. We read about a small, uh, one of the small tribes in ancient Israel, the tribes of Issachar, in, second, in First Chronicles 12, where it says that the men of Issachar understood the times and therefore knew what Israel needs to do. In the New Testament, we read in Romans 13, Paul is telling believers in Yeshua to be understanding the times. Now, in this changing world, it's essential for us to be understanding the times. And let me share with you one of my formative experiences as a young follower of Yeshua. Um, I was blessed to be part of a, a local congregation 20 some years ago and I was asked to teach a class of six and seven years old, kind of a Sunday school, Shabbat school we call it. And I love the kids, but I was petrified. I had no idea how to communicate with children. So, you know, the, the people in charge kind of to alleviate my anxiety said, I'm, we're gonna give you this high-tech device to illustrate God's truth to the children. And some of you may be, you know, may, may remember this from your childhood. It's called a flannograph. <laughs> now, flannograph is flannel board that you put figures of cloth on it to illustrate the story. And why am I telling you all this? Because as we seek to be understanding the times, Israel is God's flannograph. And as God is dealing with Israel, this is a central key in the scriptures to be understanding the times. Another facet, you know, that is on my heart to share with you this morning is that we are serving the God of the second chance. I don't know if you thought about it. In your own life, I think we see that in scripture and biblical figures and certainly among nations and the nation of Israel, but God is working in our lives in a way that I refer to as a circular way. Think about Jonah, for example. You know, and I think it's true for each one of us. God says, let's go. I try to run away. God says, oh, you run. That's fine, run. I'll send a fish. <laughs> maybe a day, maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe seven years, maybe 2,000 years. But eventually, the fish is going to spit you out. And once again, you're going to find yourself right in front of the calling God has, sent, has called you to do. And why am I telling you this this morning? Because I want to look, as we look at Zechariah chapter 1, we're looking at a time period where God has gathered 
the people of Israel from the first temple diaspora back to the land. It was a physical gathering, then there was a spiritual revival, we'll read about it in Nehemiah chapter 8, and that set the stage for the first coming of the Messiah. And all those events that happened in this flannel graph in Israel were relevant to the entire world. First coming of the Messiah. But now, we live in times where God has physically gathered the Jewish people after 2,000 years. It's quite a fish. I'll tell you about that fish a little later. But once again, there's a physical gathering, a beginning of a spiritual gathering, which I'll tell you about a little further. And that, I believe, sets the stage for the second time that the Messiah will come. And so this morning, as we look at Zechariah chapter 1, I want to look at some incredible passage and incredible uh, facts about the gathering of the Jewish people to the state of Israel, to the establishment of the state of Israel. I want to mention the current spiritual revival, as a good friend of mine likes to call it, that is taking place in this day and age. And I want to share with you some good news that you will never hear on the news, never hear on the evening news in the main channels, in the main news channels. And that is that in the Messiah, in the midst of this turmoil happening in the Middle East, Israelis and Palestinians in the Messiah love each other. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about that later. And finally, we're going to ask the so what question. So what does that, all that have to do with us as Christians, as followers, disciples of Yeshua, of Jesus around the world? So that's what we want to do. And uh, I want to share with you 11 verses today from Zechariah chapter 1. Let me tell you a little bit about Zechariah. He's a very interesting biblical figure. His name means God remembers. God remembers. And Zechariah was born in Babylon, and he came back to the land with his grandfather. His grandfather's name is Edo, one of the very important priestly, priestly families in Israel. And he becomes one of the leaders of the 12 priestly families. They came back under Zerubbabel, which was, you know, was the first group of Jews that came back uh, in line with a, a decree by Cyrus, the Persian king. And very importantly, he was called to his prophetic ministry as a young man. Na'ar is the word in the Hebrew. And that's the same word that used to, uh, uh, when God called Jeremiah, when God called Ezekiel, God calls young people to serve him. Not just gray-haired people young people. And as Paul, is telling, as Paul is telling Timothy, let no one despise your youth. Youth is no excuse for running away from God's calling. And Zechariah is a contemporary of Haggai, if I'm, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and Malachi. Zechariah's prophecy focuses on messianic end time type prophecies, very relevant for us. The first six chapters of the book of Zechariah are, contain eight visions, eight prophecies given him in one night. I mean, the Lord really downloaded on him that night. And um, we're going to look at the very first of those visions. So let me read with you, and forgive my accent if I'm mispronouncing, but let's read um, Zechariah chapter 1, verses 7 to 12. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, as follows. I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and, white, and he was standing among the myrtle trees, which were in the ravine, with red sorrel and white horses behind him. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? And the angel who was speaking with me said to me, I will show you what these are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah with which you have been indignant 
these 70 years. So in this first vision, the main figure that Zechariah sees is a figure of a man riding a red horse. Now, the identity of this figure of a man is getting clearer as we read on in the passage, but initially, you know, the fact that he's sitting on a horse is a position of royalty in the scriptures. The horse is red, which signifies in biblical symbolism judgment. And then Zechariah tells us he's an angel, an angel. He calls him my Lord. But then in verse 11, the identity is clarified. He's not an angel only. He's the angel of the Lord. Malach Adonai. The incommunicable name of God is in that figure. And only one heavenly being is called by that name in the Hebrew scriptures. This is the same one that spoke to Abraham as he was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. He was the one in the burning bush revealing to Moses. He was the one that leading the Israelites in the desert spoke to Balaam, spoke to Joshua, spoke to Gideon, spoke to the parents of Samson, to Elijah, and now speaking to Zechariah. This is no other than the pre-incarnate Messiah himself. And this is what, by the way, very interestingly, the rabbinic commentaries for these passages actually confirm that. It's impossible to ignore. So this is Jesus before he incarnate. So this majestic figure, the pre-incarnate Messiah, is there with majesty and judgment. Behind him there are more horses with different colors, more riders. We'll talk about them in a second. But he's in, located in a very unusual position. He's among the myrtles. The myrtles. You know, you see many of them here in Jerusalem, particularly in lower slopes of the Judean hills. It's a very humble shrub. Here in the passage, they call it, the translation calls it trees, but it's actually not a tree. It's a shrub, very lowly, very humble. Doesn't bear any edible fruit, but when you rub it, it produces a nice smell. And this myrtle is located at a very lowly place. Translation says, in the ravine, the actual Hebrew word here is quite a peculiar word, metsula, that means in the depth. That same word is used in Psalm 107 to talk about the depth of the sea where the, the light of the sun does not shine. You know, kind of where Jonah was in the belly of the fish and God yet still heard him. So the myrtle symbolizes Israel, the lowly and degraded state of Israel at the time. And I'm going to talk about afflicted and degraded Israel in a moment, but it is peculiar that the majestic pre-incarnate Jesus is among his people. And behind them there are more horsemen and more horses. We read that they patrol the earth. They patrol the earth. The language is very similar to the language of Job chapter 2, where the messengers of Satan who is not omnipresent like God, but he still imitates God and try to send messengers to patrol the earth. But it's an imitation. This is the real deal. This is God's patrol. And what did they find? They report back to the angel of the Lord and they said, we've patrolled the earth and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. Now, note the reaction of the pre-incarnate Jesus, the pre-incarnate Messiah. So we have the peaceful and quiet nations on the one hand, everything's cool, and on the other hand, the lowly and degraded state of Israel. And here we see in verse 12 a prayer, an intercessory prayer that gives us a glimpse, a Hebrew scripture glimpse into the intercessory role or function of the Messiah as we see in the New Testament. Verse 12, And then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, God of armies, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judea with which you've been indignant these 70 years? The Messiah is interceding for his people. Israel, like he's interceding for the uh, people of God now who are followers of the Messiah from all the nations. 
So a very strong and emotional reaction. And as we continue to read, we'll see that this prayer raises a very strong and emotional reaction from God Almighty himself. Now the affliction of Israel. How are the Jews afflicted? How were the Jews afflicted? You know, and I'll tell you about our experiences growing up here in Israel, but I just want to share with you briefly, and believe me, extremely briefly, but highlights from the last 2,500 years that experiences that are deeply ingrained in the life and the heart of every Jewish person. So Jewish history 101. First temple diaspora, you know, shortly before the passage we're reading here, was the first exile, the Babylonian exile. City was destroyed, the temple was destro destroyed, and hundreds of thousands were killed. The rest were exiled by King Nebuchadnezzar. As, you know, the Jewish people, God has brought them back. Then, 70 years after the birth of Yeshua, of Jesus, AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed once again by Titus and his army. You know, really, the, the estimate of how many Jews were killed greatly varies. Roman historians say 100,000 Jews were killed. Uh, Josephus says more than a million. But anyway, quite a significant number. Importantly, in 70 AD, although Ju the city is destroyed, Jerusalem and the temple, Jews are still allowed to, to remain in Israel. And then in 135, the second rebellion, Jewish rebellion, the Romans come with four legions and kill millions, millions, millions of Jews here in the country. The majority of those that survived are sold into slavery. Uh, Roman historians tell us that a price of a Jewish slave at that time was cheaper than a loaf of bread, and very, very, very few Jewish people survive. That's really the beginning of the second diaspora. We're jumping ahead about a thousand years to the first crusade. First crusade in, 1190, in uh, 1096, you know, the religious emotions rising in Europe have caused, particularly in France and Germany, Thousands of Jewish communities are destroyed because we are accused of being Christ killers. In 1144, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, but that's when it really came to be very strong in church history, the blood labels. That's a fable that the Jews are killing Christian children and making the Passover matzah with their blood. And over that, thousands of Jews are killed in the Middle Ages, persecuted, murdered, and so on. 1290, England, not a lot of people know this, but King Edward I in 1290 signed a, a decree, a warrant, and that England will become clean of Jews, and any Jew that does not convert under the sword will be deported. So the British or the English deportation, and Jews were not allowed in England for 500 years, not a lot of people know that. Jumping ahead a couple of hundred years, 1347-38, 38, uh, 48, this is the uh, black, black uh, death plague in Europe. Millions are killed in Europe, and, you know, the crowd's looking for who to blame, and naturally, it's the Jews, of course, the false accusation, the Jews were poisoning the wells of the Christians. In 1396, deportation of 100,000 Jews from France. Whenever I'm saying deportation, you have to understand, a lot of massacres, a lot of forced conversions, in 1421, same is happening in Austria. In 1492, my family was there. The biggest Jewish community, the biggest Jewish community in the world, very strong, wealthy community in Spain, King Ferdinand and his wife Isabella sign a warrant to clean Spain from all the Jews. All the Jews are deported from Spain. 1496, four years later, Portugal does the same thing. Jumping another 500 years, late 19th century in the Muslim world, an uprising in, in Muslim religious feelings and forced conversions, massacres in many Muslim countries. Early part of the 20th century, the Russian pogroms, massacres in Russia and the Russian Empire, and kind of modern era, 70 years ago, 1939 to 45, the Holocaust, where among other, many other millions, six million Jews are murdered for the sole cause purpose that they are Jewish and, you know, Hitler's regime desires to annihilate the Jews. 
Now, before I move on, I just want to share how that, you know, that history plays out in life of uh, Jewish Israelis today. And it's true for my generation, it's true for my children's generation. So the school year begins in, in September. You know, we go to school. There's a couple of months of a stretch of, of studies. We uh, come to December, and in December, we commemorate the Feast of Hanukkah. In Hanukkah, the Greeks tried to destroy the Jews, but God saved us, so we celebrate for eight days, and our kids go back to school. A couple of months later, our kids celebrate the Feast of Purim, you know, the Book of Esther, where Haman tried to destroy our people, but God saved us, we celebrate for a few days, we go back to school. A month later, we celebrate the Feast of Passover, where Pharaoh tried to annihilate our people, but God saved us, we celebrate for eight days, kids go back to school. A couple of weeks later, we commemorate the Holocaust Memorial Day, where Hitler tried to annihilate us, God saved us, we commemorate that day, our kids go back to school. A week later, we have Memorial Day, where, you know, in 1947, 48, when the State of Israel was declared by the United Nations, the countries around us decided that they're gonna wage a war and annihilate the Jewish people that are living in the land, but God saved us, we celebrate Independence Day, and our kids go back to school. And that cycle repeats every year. Is there a lesson there for our children? And I think that kind of begs us, this history begs us to ask the question of why? Why? Why all this persecution for this flannel graph? Why? And if you remember nothing of what I said today, this is the one thing I want you to remember. It is never, never about Israel. It's always about the God of Israel. The flannel graph is not the thing. It's what he points to. And then we want to ask, well, who, who, who would want to destroy the Jews? And it's no other than the fallen archangel known as Satan, who's using different, using different human vessels, but it's the same pattern. Now, still, another question. It begs another question. Okay, let's say Satan was trying to destroy the Jewish people before the coming of the Messiah, before Jesus came to this earth. Okay, so Haman, Pharaoh, and so on. But Jesus has come. The Messiah has come. Why is this still carry on? And Satan knows the scriptures. He has thousands of years of experience with the scriptures. And he knows that the key for human history still lays with the nation of Israel. The flannel graph still points to God's plan for humanity. And therefore, this continues. Now, in the New Testament... Paul is hinting, or not hinting, he's pointing this out for us in a lot of places, but Romans 11:12 12 says, talking about the Jewish people, now if the transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentile, the partial hardening and blindness of Israel regarding to who the Messiah Yeshua really is, Paul is saying, how much more will their fulfillment be? And as I'm, I'll be sharing with you a little bit about the vival that's taking place in Israel now, where Jewish people and Arabic people are coming to know a growing group, coming to know Yeshua as the Messiah, to claim Him as our Messiah once again. That's part of, of God's timetable. Now, returning to our passage, let's read a couple of more verses. Remember the emotional intercessory prayer of the angel of the Lord. And there comes the answer, verse 13. The Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me with Gracious words, comforting words. So the angel who was speaking with me said to me, Proclaim, shout out loud, Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I am very angry with the nations who are at ease, for while I was a little angry, they furthered the disaster. So this intercessory prayer of the Messiah gets a strong emotional reaction. Note, he says, I'm greatly angry and I have great compassion. I mean, great emotions God has given us here. And he's saying, I have not forgotten. I have not forgotten Jerusalem and Zion. Jerusalem and the other cities. Very close to my heart. 
And he says to, Jerem to Zechariah, he says, shout it out so that everybody hears. I'm exceedingly jealous. There's comfort, but there's also jealousy. And he says, you know, it's kind of like a father that's disciplining his son, and then comes a strange man with a big stick and starts beating the child up really badly. He says, I'm very angry with the nations who are at ease, for while I was a little angry, they furthered the disaster. They, they took this big stick and just beat on Israel, like the history I was sharing with you. And you know, both here, God has given us um, a glimpse, but in many other places in the Hebrew Scripture and the New Testament, God is saying, and whoever has an argument with that, <laughs> I didn't say it, the Lord said it, take it with him. But God says we, he will judge the nations based on their relation to the nation of Israel. How you treat the flannel graph has to do with your national identity and national destiny. In verses 16 and 17, God continues to speak. And he's talking about Israel's redemption, both physical and spiritual. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, declares the Lord, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. It was true to the first diaspora that came back here. We know that actually in the time of Zechariah, Haggai, the foundation of the second temple was laid. It was greatly expanded later on, and we know that the Shekinah glory, the presence of God himself, the comforter himself, came to that house. Now we read in scripture that someday there will be another temple, not, not far from here actually, very close to here. Again, God works in circular ways. And finally, verse 17, Note in verse 17, God is saying four times the word again. Maybe a better translation would have been more over, but anyhow, verse 17. Again, proclaim, saying, thus is the Lord of hosts. By the way, I want to draw your attention that in the book of Zechariah, and even in this short verses we're reading, the name of God that is used repeatedly is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, Adonai Tzavaot, the mighty, powerful name of God. Thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities, not anybody else's, my cities will again overflow with prosperity and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. God is saying, I'm going to restore. God is saying, there's going to be prosperity. The state of Israel the current state of Israel had a very, very, very humble beginning, economically as well. And the blessing that we're experiencing in Israel now, also in terms of prosperity, is unparalleled. And my colleague Kalev yesterday, my friend, shared some incredible facts about that prosperity that God has given. The Lord said, I will again comfort Zion. You know, the comfort he's talking about is a person. He is the comforter. So again, moreover, the comforter, the Messiah himself, will come and again I will choose Jerusalem. So, you know, it was a big fish, 2,000 years. But here we are, you know. Mickey's hands are moving on the flannel graph. It's happening before our very eyes. Now you've heard, if you've been to this um, conference, the firm conference, You've heard that from several people about this revival I want to share with you just a little bit. You know, we read in the book of Acts that here in this city, following the resurrection, thousands, thousands of Jewish people have become followers of the Messiah, of Yeshua. But then really, if we look at church history, after the first three centuries, it was very difficult to identify Jewish believers in Yeshua. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm not going to go into why at this moment, but it was just difficult. So I want to show you a little graph. You know, first century, very, very, very many Jewish believers. We read about thousands coming at one time. But then, through most of church history, very, very small numbers. There's always been, as a testimony to God's faithfulness, but very small numbers. Really a drop in the bucket 
in the Gentile church. When the modern state of Israel was established, there were only about 30 Jewish followers of Yeshua in the entire country. That was it. And unfortunately for you, I'm speaking to you today, not my wife. My wife's story is a lot more interesting because her family was one of those uh, 30 people. But now, as we've heard, there's a lot more people. There are several tens of thousands of Jewish and Arabic believers making up the Israeli body of the Messiah. And, um, you know, when, um, when I became a, a follower of Jesus, I shared with you a little bit about that. I felt very strongly that God is telling me, I told her to come back to Israel. So I told my family, I told my friends, the consensus was that I've lost my mind. Something terrible happened. I was brainwashed. Something terrible happened to me. But I couldn't contain it if I tried. I didn't try. So, you know, we would share on university campuses regularly, in every way imaginable. And every time I would speak to someone about Yeshua, about Jesus, the reaction would invariably be, how come you're talking to us about that? I mean, you're a Jew. You know, they hear how I speak Hebrew, they, you know, look at my nose, and they know I'm a Jew. <laughs> and when we do that now, while reaction may still not be immediately accepting, there is an awareness among the Jewish people that there is a growing group of people here in Israel and Jewish people around the world that are claiming Yeshua as our Messiah. So the remnant is growing. And I promise you some good news. Good news you'd never hear on any TV channel, you know, in the main evening news. You'd hear about the catastrophes in the Middle East, how Christian communities are slaughtered, how the children of Isaac and the children of Ishmael are not getting along. And it is true, you know. In the flesh, we don't get along. But the good news is that in the spirit, we do. And in this picture, it's a, actually a picture of several of the senior pastors and leaders in Israel. And it's probably difficult to tell, you know, we Middle Eastern all look alike, but it's actually a mixed group of Israelis and Palestinians, Jews and Arabs, and there are actually a couple here in a crowd today. And one of the, one of the you know, flagship privileges and programs we have at One for Israel, we're still the only accredited Bible college seminary in the land. And we're privileged, privileged to train and fellowship regularly, every week, week in and week out, with the leaders and the next generation of Jewish and Arab believers in this country. So I'm not telling you a, an abstract story. I'm telling you something that we are living every day and every week. Amen. So in the Messiah, the children of Isaac, the children of Ishmael complement each other. We love each other. And it's a powerful testimony. Now, you know, um, at One for Israel, we're not, just, we're not a traditional Bible college seminary only. Many of us on our staff are first generation believers, and some are now second generation already. And by the way, uh, those of you that have been here in the conference, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Moti, you know, our MC, is a celebrity in Israel. And he stars in a lot of uh, evangelistic video. I'm sure if you've taken a cab here in Jerusalem, or just walk the streets, what does everybody do? What, what, everyone, what, what are they doing? They're on their phones, right? On their smartphones. But usually they're not talking. They're surfing. And so in the last, last 10 years, especially five years, we've invested a huge amount of effort in creating the true wine, the message of the gospel, in a way that it can be present in smartphones. And uh, do we have that picture? Can we go to the next slide? In the next slide you see, I mean, the guy on the left, he's actually here in the auditorium, his name is Eitan, and he too is a celebrity here. You know, a lot of people recognize him in the streets from those videos, sharing the gospel message with Israelis. The guy on the left, his name is Carlos. 
is doing the same thing in Arabic. And that's simply a presentation of the gospel. This video was done in Hebrew only, and it was viewed in a little less than a year by 1.2 million viewers. Now, that number, let me translate that number for you. In the entire world, there are between eight and nine Hebrew speakers. So one of every eight Hebrew speakers have been exposed to the message of the gospel in this last one year. Incredible power. And if you want to hear more of that, I know that Eitan and Moti are doing a session uh, after I speak. So you can hear more from them. So what does all that mean for us today? I hope you got a glimpse of the good news. You know, with God, there's only plan A. That's actually a term that a good friend of mine uses. Only plan A with God. There's no plan B. He doesn't change his mind. I'm thankful for that. For my own life. I hope you are. In Israel, God is using Israel as his flannel graph for the nations. His clock for humanity. And we are privileged to live in times where we see history unfolding before our very eyes in a powerful way. And that is, once again, important for me to stress. This is the heart of FIRM, the Fellowship of Israel-Related Ministry. We want to say to the church, to the world around the world, it's time to awake and understand the times. It is time. Because God's plan for Israel has everything to do with the Great Commission and with His plan for the nations, for humanity. And that's why Paul is saying to the Jew first, that is God's strategy today for the Great Commission, going around the world. And I hope that, this, that God is stirring each one of us to do our part. So as I close this morning, I want to thank you for your listening and uh, viewing. And I'll finish with a short video telling a little bit of the story of the national body of the Messiah here in Israel. So thank you and God bless. People today are full of questions, attempting to define who they are by how they look, how they speak and what they believe. They struggle to explore themselves, searching for answers and will often find hope in the open arms of the world. Over the last 70 years, Israelis have been at the center of the struggle, hungry for meaning, asking questions and searching for answers. Many find joy in the comfort of the world, while others drown in the sorrow of disappointment. But some have found the answer in one name, Jesus, or as we call him in Hebrew, Yeshua. One for Israel is an initiative of native-born Israelis who are on the forefront of high-tech evangelism, bringing salvation to Israel, raising up leaders and equipping them with the tools they need to transform their communities. And with an emphasis on winning souls, building disciples and sending leaders, we promote the Kingdom of God to both Jews and Arabs throughout the land of Israel. Our Bible College has now grown into a certified educational institution offering bachelor's and master's degree programs, bringing Jews and Arabs together in the classroom and experiencing peace and unity in the name of Yeshua. From our campus, located in central Israel, we work together to proclaim the gospel of the Messiah through websites, a radio station, a television studio, classroom instruction, and the largest Christian library in Israel. Training, equipping, and providing a platform for the gospel to go forth. Also in partnership with local authorities, we provide humanitarian aid to Holocaust survivors, caring for each and every generation with the love of Yeshua. Israel has always been on the cutting edge of internet technology, and with more Israelis online per capita than even the United States, Israel continues to be ripe for evangelism on the digital frontier. I, God, Messiah, Isaiah 53, ex-Rabbi, and I met Messiah, among others, 
are all tools and outlets provided by One for Israel so the Jewish people can hear, receive, and grow in their knowledge of the Messiah. We want to promote the message of the Gospel in the land of Israel through the cooperation of Christians worldwide. Together we can care for, educate, and reach out to both Jews and Arabs in the land of Israel. As a native-born Israeli who has experienced firsthand the transforming power of the Gospel of the Messiah, I would like to invite you personally to extend a helping hand and become one for Israel. Good stuff. Really good stuff going on in our nation right now. Thank you so much, Erez, for coming and sharing at Jerusalem Encounter. Thank you so much. How was it? You got to see from this view. I could only hear it from the back. Now we're going to hear from another ministry. It's called Comfort My People. And whoa, we have some fans in the back. All right, I like it. Good energy. Their goal is to support Israel to fulfill their calling of being a light to the nations. And they do this by educating, equipping, and also advocating for Jewish believers, especially ministry leaders that are the ones reaching the body. So to tell us a bit more, please welcome Paul Roberts, the director of Comfort My People. Shalom Aleichem. I'm so thankful to be here. I'm overwhelmed by what's going on here. I didn't expect it. But I am so grateful for the firm ministry, and I ask you to forgive me for not having my team member um, badge on. I forgot it. But um, that doesn't mean I, won't forget, I will forget you, because this is deeply impacting me, and I'm even more encouraged, more enthusiastic about doing what we're doing. Comfort My People is a little bit complicated because it's actually a ministry of another ministry, missions organization called Advancing Native Missions based in Virginia, the U.S. And Advancing Native Missions is a missions organization that is now working in 83 nations. The goal is to reach the unreached people groups of the world, according to Matthew 24:14. So, very long story, which I cannot tell, but I was supernaturally brought into a relationship with the leadership there, the president of uh, A&M, and he asked me to speak about what was going on in my heart one day. Within a week, I, w I was on staff there. It's a, it, the ministry is run by faith. You're on staff by faith. So I took the step of faith along with my wife and started the ministry of construction teams ministry where I was associate director of. Associate director of construction team is ministry means we go into the nations where we have ministries and we help them with construction work. Now, three years into my time there, uh, sorry, three years ago, I was asked to consider if I would lead a ministry into Israel. And I asked him if he would give me 15 seconds to pray about that. And I said, yes. So Comfort My People took on the name Comfort My People for a specific reason. If I have opportunity, I'll tell you that. But what we, we are doing here now is we have started to identify and develop a relationship with ministries like many of you who are represented here are doing. Interestingly enough, we have three ministries that we are now, four ministries that we are now working with. When I say working with, we, it's not a partnership where it's, which has this tendency of making sense of a business relationship, 50-50, 60-40. It's all 100% Israeli ministries. We don't tell you what to do. We come alongside and help you to do what you're doing, empower you what you're doing, try to equip and advocate you, if we can, by building a bridge between the ministries here and believers in the U.S., advocating for what's going on here so that they could become family members with you 
and want to support what you're doing. It's very much like what Firm is doing. So um, when I started coming here, the first ministry is Awake Israel, Shlomi and Miriam Abramov. Some of you know they're in Rishon Litzion. Shlomi was sitting over there the first meeting. He was probably rocking this house more than anybody else, even though he's probably bigger than anyone else in this room. But Shlomi's an incredible guy. Uh, he was a bodyguard back in the day here. He's an Israeli from five generations. But um, the second one was the first day speaker, Victor Kalisher from Bible Society of Israel. And yesterday was our third ministry, which we began supporting in November, which is Biad Chaim, Sandy Shoshani spoke yesterday morning. So I found that very interesting that those are the ministries we are representing now. And we're still looking, we're searching and seeking, asking God how we can partner with other ministries that are in the same vision as ours. So I am a Jewish believer. I was um, a product of the 60s and 70s where I was um, seeking for truth. And long story short, Jesus was not in the picture, though Jesus was just all right with me, just like the song lyrics go. But I was teaching through Eastern trails, Eastern mysticism, but then I started mysteriously reading the Bible. When I got through the Old Testament, even though I went through Hebrew school, bar mitzvah and everything else, I just knew the stories. When I got through the Old Testament, started reading into the New, I come up with Jesus and I'm like, who is this guy? Why did no one ever tell me about him? I would have loved to hang out with him. So anyway, not long after that, circumstantially things happened. I was desperate, cried out to him, got saved on my kitchen floor. And just like the brother talked about before, I knew I was saved without knowing what salvation was. But I woke up that next morning miraculously being healed of an infection on my finger that was going down towards my hand, which I was prone to get as a carpenter. And, but more than that, the inside infection was also dissolved the next morning. So I didn't know what being born again meant, but I knew I was born again. And I thought that I was the only Jewish believer in the world, not just in Israel, I mean in the United States. So coming here is really fascinating to me to see what God's done since that time in 1979. We want to see it happen. This is a, we have a, the table is in the corner of the room back there. This is a picture of a smoldering wick and on the back of it gives an explanation of the ministry a little better. The smoldering wick I believe represents the Jewish people nationwide. Comfort my people is literally, when he says comfort, comfort my people, I'm going to say this wrong, but nachmu, nachmu ami, which is literally be a Noah to my people. And Noah didn't know what he was into when he started building the ark, other than what he did. But it was because of the times he was living in that it was necessary. And Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. It's important to bring comfort because and they have received double for their sins. I believe the double part is that God judged the Jews for their sin of rebellion and dismissal of who he is, but the world on top of that has judged him for 2,000 years. And so that's why the comfort part is so critical in the equation. Reaching them, speaking tender into the heart, which you as indigenous Israelis are capable of doing, but you as Gentile believers are equally capable of doing it, and we need to do it because the time is short and there's an urgency to it. So please show that one picture before I go of, a, of um, my family because I want you also to know that when I was first, before I was saved, I thought the, I was snuffed out and somebody was going to put their thumbs over the wick and that would be the end of me. I never could see into the future. But this is my family whom I represent and I see family as first to me because I want to leave a legacy for my family to know that their father and grandpa, my wife is buried in there. You're going to think she's one of the daughters and granddaughters, but she's right in the middle. We've been married for 40 years come this Sunday. We have our eighth grandchild on the way. I want to see them take the ministry way further than I ever could have because they're starting much earlier than I am. But I also want to encourage the youth here, which we want to supply a platform for you and for the ministries that, that you are underneath. 
a way where the light can be taken into the nations. We have places I could bring you. They want to hear from Jewish believers because they read the Bible. They say the light's supposed to come out of Israel. We've never even met a Jew yet. Where are they? I want to bring you with me on trips to, is to nations where you can go to safely and share your testimony, share your worship, and share the light which is now gently being restored so this flicker of a flame won't be snuffed out. It will be brighter than an atomic bomb ever could be. Bless you and thank you for your prayers. Thank you, Paul. All right, now we have our breakout sessions, just like yesterday. So we have three different breakout sessions that you can go to. One of them is gonna be with the super awesome Rabbi Matt Rosenberg. I say that biasly and unbiasedly. He's awesome all around. He's going to be talking about one people, Jews and Gentiles, in the New Covenant. So that's one of them. Now we are engaging Israeli society with the gospel on the media with Eitan Ball. And I'm also going to and be there. And yours truly right there. He'll be there too. And then there's also going to be a panel. So it's, it's an Israeli leaders panel. Um, you're going to have leaders from the land, both Christian Arabs and Messianic Jews. There'll be a panel here. You can ask questions, learn about what's going on. So we're going to dismiss in stages. So if you want to go learn about using media with Eitan and Moti to engage Israeli society uh, with the gospel, that's going to be up at the Connect Center. So that's when you go out to the doors and up to the half level to the right. So if you would like to go to the media session, start making your way up right now. We want to release you to go up there. We're trying to stand on a schedule. And if you, oh, give them a. The lobby. The lobby. Okay. So if you feel like you want to go and uh, listen to Wayne Hillsden. No, no, no. No? Oh, the second one, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jews and Gentiles in a new covenant, they meet at the lobby, at the entrance. So you want to hear about the. One Body with Matt Rosenberg, that's up in the lobby. There you go. So Media Connect Center. One people in the lobby, and then here is the panel. So if you want to be here for the local Israeli panels, you can stay here. We do ask though that you don't hang around and chat, because we want to stay on time. We want everybody to, that's here for the panel, so that we can start the panel, to be here. And everybody else to make your way to the outbreak sessions that you'd like to go to.